and to produce the most kind of positive and, and excitement that I've felt in, in so many years. So to have come 12 years or not nine years now, um, I just, you know, I feel really fortunate to be in the position that I'm in. Yeah. Which is a investment group that manages uh, and invests in uh, a very diverse range of assets across Australia. So we've got uh, cattle and sheep properties um, and timber, poultry, uh, as well as the online auction platform with Stockwell. Uh, and we're also mm -hmm. across the yeah. RLX portfolio as well, with the, with the sale yards up and down the eastern states of Australia. So it's very diverse, and what we learn in one industry applies more often than not to something else, uh, a lot of common problems, and something that comes up across each of the industries is connecting data through supply chains. I think it's going to be a really yeah. interesting discussion. Brilliant. Thank you, Jen. So. I guess if we just take a bit of a look at, at how we see the industry, we've got, we've got the pharma city in the middle here and everything is entirely disconnected and fragmented. So what we're doing on farm is, is not connected to all of those trusted advisors, all of those third parties and all of those other systems. So that might be software, it might be hardware, or it might be the supply chain. So if we're focusing on that supply chain, the way animals are transferred, the way animals are bought and sold is still very traditional and we're not getting the ma we're not maximising the value that's happening between all of that. And there's so much opportunity in connecting all of this up. So right now it's really, really fragmented. And what we believe, uh, and particularly as, as a cohort that stands up here, we believe we can pull all this together in a digital ecosystem. So, you know, I think Beef Australia this year as well is, is an enormous amount of technology, an enormous amount of opportunity that you can see all around uh, on site over this week here. And everyone's playing a part uh, in effectively the digital future of agriculture. And what we have here is, it all starts on farm. So we're collecting information on farm in a digital format in a way that can be then transferred and reproduced and add value across all those parts of the supply chain. We're a good way there to helping with some of that fragmentation and some of that disconnection. So when we look at this, how do we, how do we then add more value to animals into that, into that physical sale yard? How do we add more value to those animals that are going through an online auction plus? And from that, how do we give more value back to the producer and actually show that value from that point in time and all that blood, sweat and tears that goes into getting an animal to a point that then gets sold, how can we enhance that and how can we then use that in, in the greater supply chain? So what we want to kind of quickly chat about and, and, and go through with, with the gents on stage is, is maybe just a bit of an understanding of the, the challenges of kind of the, the sales process that we've got now. Maybe we'll start with the physical sale yards uh, and then have a look at the online piece uh, and sort of unlock a bit of that. So I might just hand that over to you, Bill, to kick off how you see that with a, with a physical salary our presence. Information is power, and we all know that we keep picking and told that data is incredibly valuable, but it's not always immediately obvious why or how that data becomes valuable. What we know with systems like this gentleman's and, and Stop Live, uh, what we know about those platforms is it's another opportunity to provide the market with a better opportunity to promote their product. And, and through that, we're adding information. So we're adding video and photo and histories about the animals. We're always looking for more. The more information we have around that sort of perspective, the better it is. It's the, the better it is for the producer to promote the hard work that they've put in and the decisions that they've made very carefully through the life of the animal. Uh, and the better it is for the buyer, for their clients, for the agents, where they're moving to next, for the processor, and ultimately to the consumer. So it's all about adding more information. And, and what I think we have, and we're probably going to get to it, is an opportunity to take the information that's being gathered by the producer in systems like Agri-Web and bring it through. And obviously, at the other end of that spectrum, we've got this opportunity to send that information from the processor back to the breeding program, closing that and connecting the dots. Because that's the, the issue. When, when, when you're selling cattle, um, it's, it's very straightforward to tell people where they've come from. Not always as straightforward a step before that or a step before that, unless you're talking about um, 
the, the elite level yeah. um, is where you're really interested in the start to finish of the breeding. It's not always that easy to connect those dots. It's incredibly valuable. And getting the information at the other end back to the actual producers is probably even more so. Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, I mean, we're, we're not talking about you know a, a, an easy way of actually connecting all these dots. It, it is challenging, uh, but there's an enormous amount of opportunity. And, and if we look at what's what's happening for for the most cases, is animals come in, unload off trucks, they get in a whole bunch of pens, and they're basically then effectively sold on a visual inspection, right? People are walking around assessing animals. Then there's some form of live bid and live auction and it's on the day of, of what those results are. To, to a point, uh, we, we do a lot of work in our pre-sale catalogues because we understood, that is traditionally, you're right, but that is, and, and generally, that is still how We felt the importance of the data and to show the commitment that we've got to it, all cattle are catalog pre-sale. Uh, if it's a pre-weighed site, or a weighed and processed that way, the grading that MLA does is available, so this third party uh, grading that's going on as well as well as the information that the agents or the vendors want to have added to those logs is all accessible pre-sale well in advance. So this gives the opportunity for agents and, and buyers and the broad market the opportunity to really make sure they know what they're getting for, to know what the opportunity is on the day in advance and yeah, determine whether or not it's going to be a good opportunity for them to go and visit. You know, visit physically or through a platform like Stockdive or uh, if, if that's the way that they'd like to invest, to, to go that way, that's perfect. So we sort of offer both of those options. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we look forward to unlocking what the future of that looks like, because I know we've had some pretty exciting discussions of, of what buying and selling could look like in, in, a, in, a physical, in a physical scenario. Angus, what's your kind of view of, of the state of, of, of your business in the market on that? Yeah, I think Bill said it, information's power. Um, information um, from a seller perspective uh, is um, gives them the opportunity to, to present all of the details around that article. So we capture over 100 and dif 120 different data points. Um, we've got accredited assessors that go out and, um, and those assessors are audited and, um, and uh, benchmarked and, um, and trained on, a, on an annual basis. And so there's this third party um, assessment done um, of the livestock. Um, we capture 120 data points and to be honest with you that assessment entry is continually evolving um, and our assessors continue to kind of uh, uh, question us on why we are adding more data points into um, our assessment and it, it's not necessarily you know from our point of view as a, as a digital platform we want to make it as as easy as possible to capture data um, but the reason we're putting more information is is because that's what the buyers are requesting um, and so i think you know we hear it um all too often that the consumer you know we've got to produce produce for what the consumer wants and their needs uh, we can't be sitting here going i just keep producing what i want um, and there's no market for it uh, it's the same as an ag tech kind of um, concept where you sit there and you go i've got a great idea uh, let me go and find a problem for it. Um, we know the problem, which is consumers want information. Um, now in the digital world, consumers want more and more information. They want to know, they want to understand the provenance. They want to understand the biosecurity. They want to understand the environmental impact. They want to um, understand the regenerative impact. Um, uh, they want to understand the processes that uh, it took to create the meal that they are eating. Um, and I think you know, COVID-19 and the global pandemic has just fast-tracked that desire of consumers for more information on the food that they are eating. So if consumers want it, then that starts to have to flow back down the supply chain. Um, and so what Auctions Plus kind of, is, you know, that the supply supplying those 120 data points, the buyer has a huge amount of confidence um, in what they're buying. Uh, they might be looking to restock with quality genetics. They've got all of the genetics information there. Uh, they might be looking to buy some stock that have similar grazing kind of um, patterns to themselves. Um, so, you know, it's really around providing information for people to make more informed decisions. Um, 
more informed decisions um, mean that people along the supply chain will become more connected. No, I think that's a great point, and, and I was going to touch on that. You know, COVID nineteen obviously drove you know amazing growth for, for your business on people not physically being able to go to, to, to sale yards and, and you know moving online and those types of things. So I guess the first question is, you know, do you see that trend continuing? And, and do you think we've now started to shift into that kind of digital age of, of agriculture? Um, and then also, you know, I guess the second part of that question would be, you mentioned that this has really been driven by the consumer, right? And the consumer now, you know, really wants to understand what's happening. And, and I think the impact of, uh, of considering the carbon footprint of what's coming that, down that supply chain. When, when we look at data and information and, and the current kind of fragmentation, there's two parts of this really. One is sort of, a top-down consumer-driven approach where it's like we want to see this and therefore at a farm level we're going to have to do more to ultimately deliver upon that and and at some point you know it might not be a choice it might be you're going to have to do this otherwise you're not in the market and then the second one is a performance point right so the ability to you know actually collect information and and, and then be able to make data driven decisions across that whole value chain uh, is also a big kicker of, of kind of a carrot and stick approach. So, be interested in your views on, on those two points. Yeah, I'll start with the last question. Uh, carrot is always best, if I'm honest with you. And I think, um, I guess my, my, just my points around the consumer's desires for more information, we need, they don't necessarily need to be the, the primary driver of it, um, but we need to be aware of it. Um, and we need to have our eyes up and be conscious of, you know, that this is what our consumer is wanting um, and needing. And so, yes, we might have to make some changes uh, to the data that we capture or the production systems that we kind of, um, that we use. But what I believe what data can really do is actually, um, and if data is used correctly, um, then it can actually drive profitability and drive productivity. Um, it, it's really that simple. Uh, and I think we're now, swinging back to your first question, are we at the digital age of, of agriculture? 150%, yes, and that's not because of um, the growth that we've seen. I just think it is the growth of all technology platforms in agriculture. Um, I mean, you look here, we've got a, an ag tech yard uh, at Beef Australia. Um, every second uh, kind of stall has some form of IT attached to it. Um, so even some of the most of the hardware, I guess, and, and, and like sellers have some form of software attached to it. So the digital age of agriculture is here. Um, the tricky bit now is that there is so much in the market. How can you actually, and there's so much in the market that is either capturing data, um, sharing data, um, but how can you actually connect all of the dots and create tools that add value? And add value, it, it's, it's really around, can, can it make the producer more money? Uh, can it save them money? Or can it save them time? Um, and I think that's the big, uh, as businesses, uh, AAM, Auctions Plus, AgriWeb, where we all have to kind of collectively get our heads around that, you know, the data is the data, but it's actually what we do with the data and how we package it up for the producers where the real value is going to be. Yeah, actually, that, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, producers have, have been in with it their, their entire lives for generations, but they're not going to do it unless we see an ROI. So, so it's always going to come back to that, I think. And, and but I'd love to go back to, um, so obviously, you know, we, we've talked a bit about the online space, but I, but, I, but I want to go back to the physical sale yards because conversations you and I had a while ago around, um, you know, we can see great efficiencies going online and there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of value for all stakeholders, buyers, sellers and, and alike. Um, but that physical piece is a really key part around the social fabric and the cultural fabric of where these physical sites are, you know, in our, in our great regions of, of, of the communities. Um, and they're a big part, right? It, you know, those weekly, those weekly sale yards, people are coming together, getting a steak sandwich, having a cup of coffee, and it's a big part of the community. Um, and so we've got, to be really, we've got to be really, I guess, mindful of that. And while we want to drive efficiencies and values uh, and value to the entire supply chain, we've got to be really careful of, of not upsetting that social fabric. Um, and some of, the, some of the work that you're doing around that, I think, is just enriching that whole experience. So I'd love to share some views on that. 
Yeah, it, it is a really good point. I, they are critical sites to a lot of communities in terms of what is required socially. You know, we're having fewer and fewer less sporting clubs, uh, we've got fewer uh, small businesses, we've got fewer, fewer opportunities for rural people to come together. So they are critical, but the social importance of it alone isn't enough because economic is economic. So if it doesn't stack up for everybody involved in the supply chain, it actually doesn't matter. That's why your tennis club shut down because it's not profitable. So we need to be looking after these communities and we need to have these facilities there. We need options. We need options like options plus and stock plant. And we need to be adding value to what we're doing in the sale yards as well. It needs to work economically as well as socially because it, it can't just be socially. It's not a charity. Now, we've got investors to look after and we've got stakeholders through the whole supply chain to look after as well. How do we do it? Well, we innovate. We make things more efficient, we make them safer, we make them faster, we add value by adding data, we inform everybody involved in the supply chain around what's going through, we bring everything together and we give people options and the market will decide where, where the best value is. And uh, okay. you know, I was just going to add to that, I think what's really important is that it's, um, it's not an online versus offline conversation um, there is and, it, and it's not a do you use the digital note, notepad which is AgriWeb or the physical notepad um, I think for us it's we need to give producers options um, and there'll be stock that are suited for sale yards and there's stock that's suited for online and there's stock that's suited um, to go direct you know and I think we recognise that and what it's really about is making sure that we as businesses actually lift our heads up out of the sandpit and operate as an ecosystem. Um, that's our view is that it's, you know, if we can collaborate as opposed to compete, that is going to drive greater success for our clients and the clients are the producers on the ground. So greater collaboration in the industry, I think is going to be absolutely critical so it's not an us for them it never should be an us for them um, and and it really should be a you know how can we come together and actually give more back um, and at, at each point in time um, that producer will decide what they want to do and, that, and that's the decision that is up to them yeah absolutely and I, and I think um, you know we've talked a lot about kind of you know the opportunities and giving value and and maybe let's just talk through some a potential sort of real life example of, of what that could look like, right? So, we, so you know, we're not talking about what those hypotheticals are. And some of the conversations we've had around that is, you know, if we've got producers out there that are collecting data day to day on all of these animals um, on a system like AgriWeb, how can they then continue with that, with that process and all of that rich data and rich kind of intellectual property that's with that animal or those groups of animal, how can that then be involved in that next, in that next stage? And, and Bill, I know that we chatted about you know, the process of animals being in a pen, and this could either be a physical pen or a virtual pen, uh, and then not just seeing animals on face value of, of what's sitting in front of you, but actually having the richness of all of that history that sits behind them. Seeing all of that animal health detail, all of those average day life weight gains, seeing the genetics, seeing actually the performance of those animals and those traits, um, and actually bringing that to life. And I think that's a real example of if this information is collected along the journey, it can then go with that animal's life, whether, whether it ultimately goes and, and gets its head chopped off and ends up in a box, or whether it goes to another producer to, to take that on the journey. And I think that there um, is really powerful and, and sounds exciting just to look at, but at the end of the day, are they gonna get paid for it? Uh, and is there value? Are people prepared to pay more because they see that information just displayed in that lot, whether it be physical or virtual. It'd be good to get your views on that. It goes back to your earlier question about carrots and whips and so on. Um, the whip, whips or sticks. Whips or sticks. The, the, the whip in this case is around biosecurity. So end-to-end -end tracking and not just paddock to plate. And actually paddock to plate isn't quite right because what we have is property to processor. We don't have the detail on what happens on the property and we don't have really what happens after the process, but we might come to that in a minute. But what we've what we've got is the opportunity to take that information in the paddock, um, 
that can be used for biosecurity that add that uh, carrot side of things to the market. So we can say these are the really carefully made management decisions. We can take an example like your integration with Seabay Lab, which is a, a satellite pasture biomass tool. Satellite goes over every five days, tells you how much feed you have in your pack. Us or not, but it's pretty good and for large operations where it's difficult to get around with work, pretty handy. So what you can do is present the information in sale saying this is the situation for the paddock that it was in through its whole history. Because the data's there and, and it's being collected automatically and it's valuable. And you can benchmark that against somewhere else, for example, for a different period in time. And I think it'll add value in terms of what that's worth to the processor. Whether it's worth what it would cost to, to close these gaps for the consumer, that's a different and more challenging discussion. It's being done, you're seeing QR codes on certain brands, and uh, you're seeing attempts in restaurants as well around providing that full traceability post-processor. But it, it's certainly a, a very interesting challenge around increasing awareness and making the technology for these processes and end consumers to actually access the information. Yeah, and, and I'll just make a very quick comment, but I'd be good to get Angus' views on that. You know, the consumer around scanning a QR code is, is one part of, of, of the picture, right? And it's a very kind of sexy and, and a great story to tell, right? You scan the barcode and you, and you see a farmer in the southeast of South Australia, you know, and where that state comes from. But we've also got to keep in mind there's, a, there's an enormous market, there's an enormous commodity market out there that's still sacking shelves and filling patties and filling sausages and filling burgers. Uh, and, and so we can't get caught up too much in or we need to scan a barcode because that's that's the future. Uh, I think there's, there's a great story to tell and there's, there's a market for that, but that food security piece is absolutely critical for all of it, right? Whether it be commodity or, 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 a, or a nice consumer piece. Um, and also the production and the gains and the value through that through that broader supply chain. So it's very important that we always break that down um, and because you know the piece around paddock to plate is tells a nice story but let's not forget about the real production gains and ultimately you know if we're going to feed 10 billion people if we're going to do it cleaner and greener and, and have, a, have a, a real mind on carbon and the environment we're not going to get there if we get back to that kind of fragmented disconnected model it's not it's just we're just not going to get there so we need to make not incremental changes we need to make step changes we need to make step changes in this entire process and obviously you know we're all believers of of the digitization and the collaboration of that. So when you asked if, um, you know, would people call, uh, pay more because you've now got all of this information? And I think, honestly, I don't know whether we know that answer right now. Um, but I think I look at it from a, um, from a, probably two points. And the first point is from an efficiency point of view. And it might not necessarily be uh, the, the capturing of the data. Um, what it really, would it, and ideally if we go back to that ecosystem conversation which is you know if we can integrate with you know ENVDs and NLIS and um, you know uh, processor induction programs and, and feeder programs and you know and integrate with sale yard software and integrate with auctions plus and, and dare I say it, even integrate with with other farm management software I think it is are there any others uh, well, good question <laughs> but and, and that's really it, right? It, it's it's about saying, well, it's it's the ability to, you know, I've purchased stock, um, and along with that purchase comes a batch of information, um, and that batch of information can then be, you know, comes along in a digital form and put up into my farm management. Now let's hope it's AgriWork to AgriWork, but it could be AgriWork to X, and and I think from that point of view is it's it's. That then gives, it's almost like paying it forward, you know, that then gives that buyer a, a running start, you know, he then has daily weight gains, he then has, um, you know, birthing weights, he then, he understands what he has purchased far more. So I, I don't think there's going to be an, an immediate kind of spike because suddenly this information is available, but what I do think is that over time you will see a trend up um, and that could be because you know people who do want to buy livestock that they're, they're arriving and suddenly they're more productive they're hitting the ground uh, they're more productive because 
the coffee's got more, he understands more about what he's purchased. Uh, and it's not just, you know, whether it be sale yards or, or online, uh, data's captured at a point in time. Um, and, it, and it then kind of sits there frozen. Um, but if you can actually create, I mean, make data that is fluid, uh, and, and the big one for me is actually how do we get back um, to, to, the, to the breeder? Um, and if we can do that, and, and do that full feedback loop, then I think, yeah, you will start to see efficiency gains um, at the absolute minimum. I, I think that's it. That that's the one thing we haven't specifically spoken about is what's coming back. We've spoken a lot about what's going out and what's coming back. And the piece that's got to come back, you know, in, in my opinion, and, and obviously your opinion as well, is, is that carcass data, is that feedback. But most times a producer would sit there uh, they blood, sweat and tears into these animals, they go off into processing and they sit and wait and the only thing they look at is if the money's ended in the bank account. Right? What they should be looking at is how did, what, what are my results? How did those animals perform and how can I improve? And, and you know, it's, it's fragmented, it's disconnected, it's not easy to do that. Um, and, you know, information comes back in spreadsheets or, or PDFs and, and, or not, not at all and it's not an easy way to consume that information and then go and make a management decision. But that feedback loop is actually really, really critical in all of this. A really great example, which a uh, producer, producer once told me, which was, you know, oh, I'm a cow-calf operator, I'm a breeder, and I produce wieners and I put them into the, into the sales, um, you know, the southern wiener sales every year, uh, and I get great prices for them. Uh, now, I'm a breeder and I invest heavily in genetics. Um, but once they've, been sold at the wiener sale, I don't actually know how they're performing at the grass fed backgrounder or in the feedlot or at the processor. So how am I to actually make appropriate genetic decisions for me when I'm buying bulls because I actually don't know the impact of them right at the end of the supply chain. Um, and obviously as a breeder, you're the one that is heavily investing in seed stock. Um, you know, we saw the, how, how successful the seed stock sales were last year and the averages are up and the, and the top prices are up. So everybody is restocking with quality, um, quality genetics. Um, but I think that is one problem. I don't know, the, don't know the answer to it. And, and when the producer put that to me, I thought kind of a light bulb went off and they said, you know, They've landed in the wiener sale, could be one of our wiener sales, could be a Hamilton wiener sale, or you know, one of the RLX site wiener sales. But I don't know whether I'm buying the right bulls or chasing the right trades. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, you know, it's tying all this together. And, and um, you know, there's some groups out there that have the, I guess, have the, the advantage of having an integrated supply chain, right? They have the advantage of being fully connected uh, and they can track everything from genetics to processing and getting that loop back. Um, and you know, you, arguably, even those integrated supply chains aren't making the most of those opportunities. Uh, but we know we get back to the start; it's very fragmented. How do we start getting that? And and the key to some of this is, is tracking at the source. Now, I do want to get to um, allowing people to start flying some questions from the floor. So, if anyone does have any questions at any point, throw the hand up. Um, and uh, and I guess while, while a couple more points here. Um, one interested to we spoke a lot about the, 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 the buyer, the seller, or I should say the producer. But what about the other um, you know the agents and the other the other stakeholders involved? And I, and I had a little uh, you know just just a just a little beef week joke sitting in there just in case everyone was asleep. But uh, but but maybe we could talk through you know the other stakeholders are involved in, in some of these more traditional processes. Uh, what, what's, how, how do they get involved in enriching uh, and adding value to what they're doing day to day and, and the rest of the supply chain? Well, the, the agents are the connectors between this information. So the breeders know what the processes are getting out of their cattle because the agents will tell them. And they know what's being successful because the market determines it. The, up the supply chain, if you, if you work your way back, the processor is prepared to pay more for the better product that was there before and they're prepared to pay more for the step before that and fill this down. It's just not always apparent why. You know that you're getting more, but you're not necessarily completely aware of where the demand is. And an agent can't be across the entire supply chain. So their role in this is also a fantastic opportunity. 
to have access to some very powerful information to continue to guide and you know, provide all of this advice, come up with opportunities for the marketing of, of their cattle. Uh, they're definitely a critical part of it. They're already playing the role of the connector, but I think it can be strengthened by what we're talking about, which is bringing all of these different parts of the industry together, uh, but making sure that that works for everyone as well along the way and make sure that it economically it makes sense for them to do that. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen. If the producer can't see the value of getting this information from the whole supply chain, why would they give it back to the initial uh, the initial start of the whole chain? It's not going to happen. In fact, they might see some reason why they shouldn't do that. They might want to keep some producers in the dark. So whatever it is that we're pushing through, it needs to be clear about what the value is for every stakeholder and make sure this is the incentive. And what's good for the goose is good for the game, but they, but they need to make sure that they know what's in it for them. Anything to add from the, from the agent perspective there? Yeah, I, I think Bill summed it up, you know. Um, agents are con connectors, they're, they're consultants. Um, you know, they're, they're valued partners to um, producers. Um, and some producers value them differently and, and use agents differently. Um, and I think they are such an important role and, and whether it be an agent or, or, or a, um, you know, an agronomist or um, a business manager or a success coach, um, you know, depending on the size and the type of operation, quite often there is external support. Um, and I think agents are, you would throw into that bundle um, as, as an external support. I know as a business, um, you know, we invest in, in, in leadership and, and we have a, um, an external leadership coach that comes in and, and, and helps us as a business become better leaders. Um, and I think, you know, it is that external support that businesses need and agents are a critical part of that external support that the producers have made. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I want to come back to a point that you made there, Bill, which, which ultimately feeds into kind of the, the, the end of this, which is around data privacy and who owns it and those types of things. Um, because we, we hear this a lot in terms of, you know, well, well, who owns it and, and, and all those types of things. And, and I guess, you know, good vendors, trustworthy vendors, you know, AgriWeb being, being one around the farmer owns their data, it's their information, it's not going anywhere, it's not shared with anyone without their consent. So, so they should just be the fundamental pr principles of technology companies that are handling really valuable pieces of information. I see some nodding heads of, of other technology providers. The thing that we've got to get comfortable with is collaborating and sharing. Because if, if, if we're holding all those keys close to our chest, we're not going to solve, we're not going to, we're not going to solve some of these major pain points we've just discovered and we're not going to see those opportunities. And so the whole, the whole point around, well, if I'm sharing my information, that's mine and, and it's a data grab. So, if, if we look at this, you know, if, if we look at an example, right, producer, and maybe the same example of a producer direct to a processor, right, and a producer would sit back and be, well, I'm not sharing my data with the processor because then they'll just use it to rinse me on, on grid prices, right? And that can be a very common response that we hear quite often around that. And actually, we need to flip that conversation. And we need to say, actually, if you share that information, imagine what you could get back, right? And examples of what you could get back would be that carcass data. Imagine if you put all that information in and that carcass data came back and you could match that up against all of that information that you'd stored that animal along the way and that would show you how that performed. And everyone wins. The producer can do a better job, they can produce a better animal and actually get paid more for it. Right? The process is more efficient, they make more money and you know what? The consumer gets a better piece of steak. So everyone across that value chain is actually winning and there's way more efficiencies, much more sustainable. So we're then starting to hit those, hit those macro goals. So we've got to, we've got to be really open-minded about this uh, and we've got to be collaborative in nature uh, and, and kind of bring down these barriers that, that sometimes exist, probably not always, but sometimes exist between these stakeholders um, around how you may weaponize that data rather than use it to, to, to be valuable. Now, of course, there's examples of where that's happened but if we put really, put really kind of trust, uh, trusting principles and we're all acting with integrity around, around how we're gonna manage and use that information, the macro impact and value is, is clear and simple 
and we've seen it in other industries, right? Agriculture is the least digitised industry in the world, and livestock agriculture is the least digitised of the least digitised. I've said this about 25 times already this week, but 2% of livestock agriculture digitally, uh, globally, is digitised. 2%. If we can start increasing that, imagine, imagine the outputs and impacts we can have, uh, not just at a producer level, not just at a country level, but at a global macro level, it's, it's pretty exciting. I want to um, get any final comments on that because I do want to open up to the floor to see if there's any any questions um, from anyone that, that's uh, any, any final comments before I hand the mic around. Any any yep. Beautiful. In the old days, loose ship used to sink ships. So what's loose data going to sink? What privacy or algorithms we stop? Google, Facebook and those guys just chopping in everywhere. It's a good it's a good one. Um, what Google and Facebook had the unpleasant experience of doing is being the first and enforcing it on the market because they were the only option. The only way this is going to work is through really careful consultation, understanding what parts of the step that you're in can we help improve. What, what, what is it from the previous step in the chain that you're going to find more valuable? And making sure that whatever information you're collecting is more valuable in the next step again. As far as the privacy of that information goes, obviously we're only going to be sharing things in, in this situation, when I say we, I mean the industry, um, that each party is, is agreeable to. And, and that's the challenging part, is finding what information we're prepared to share that's adding value. Um, and it, it's about looking at the industry, not so much as processor competing with processor or producer with producer, it's more about beef competing with alternative meats or beef competing with veganism. It's about making sure that we can make it environmentally more sustainable, make it more efficient in terms of water and land and everything else that goes along with it. And what we can do by connecting these dots, I think is worth some of the trade-off that might be found in the internal comp competition that's going on. Uh, you might find, com to your, compared to your competitors, um, there, there might be some sacrifice, but more broadly, if the industry can be lifted up, that might well be worth it. And that's part of the consultation that needs to go on with this and making sure that everyone's needs uh, are really well understood. I'll just add, um, you know, Facebook and um, who got, you know, obviously, whacked pretty hard we all didn't we didn't agree to share the information that they collected or we didn't know that we were agreeing to share the information that they collected and then on sold and i think that's the difference um for, for an ecosystem in, in agriculture to work if i'm sharing data to bill or to, to john i am agreeing to share the information that i'm willing to share i don't have to share it it's not mandated, but as Bill said, if I do share it, I do get some value. And what that value is, I don't think we can put a dollar figure on it. I don't think we can actually, um, you know, quantify it right now. You actually need to start the process. Uh, we need to start the change process and kind of trust the fact that collaboration is actually going to lift us all up. Um, and, and that's the end goal. Um, so it has to be agreeable. The only thing I would I would add is uh, there's a reason why Facebook and Google are free. Uh, now nothing's free, and it just so happens that software development is really really expensive. And so if you're using really amazing, and they are amazing, Google products, Google Maps, they are unbelievable products, but they're free. So what does that actually mean? At some point in time, they're going to need a return themselves. And so they are mining and they are harvesting that information. And we've all agreed to that because we're using that free product. So I would just leave that with you in terms of how you think about when you're looking at other products and other software out there, what it actually means in terms of what you're giving up and, and, and what that return might be. Yeah, so I always thought that knowledge you get for free, experience is what you pay for. Any other any other questions? 
See, yeah. Yeah, um, in your opinions, the uptake of data across the supply chain from different levels is a challenge, particularly, I would say, like, particularly from a producer's perspective, and understanding how the use of that data can support them elsewhere or the other way around from the processor level. How is the industry going to improve that? The uptake of data and then understanding and educating different people about its purpose, its benefits, what it can assist with. Look, I, I think it's actually a, a really, really good question. And if I had the answer to that, <laughs> that there would be a lot more digital. We wouldn't be at 2% digitization, we'd be at 98% digitization. Um, what we have seen, right, in the seven years since we founded AgriWeb is an enormous change in adoption of technology, an enormous change. When we started, we'd be at field days, and admittedly the tents were a bit smaller at that point in time, it was a pull-up banner. But uh, when we started, the conversation was, no, I didn't even know about technology or software or, or apps in it at that point. That the, the, the conversation wasn't even there. Now the conversation is, I'm already using something, a tag web or something else, uh, and you know, I'm going really well, I've got some challenges, or it's, I know I need to do it, I'm still on pencil and paper, I'm still in a spreadsheet, but I know I need to change. So we've seen, we have seen a huge shift in that education awareness of, we know we need to change, we know it's coming. Um, I still think there's a really big gap around what's in it for me and what's the return on investment, right? Uh, and actually, most of the conversation that we have is not around how much it's going to cost when I put my credit card down, but it's change management, right? It's, I've been doing this, and we've been doing this literally for generations. How are we going to change our business, change our stakeholders in this process uh, as, as a first point of call? And, and then, you know, how are we going to supercharge and maximise that to really move our business forward? So um, I think, you know, I, I'm not sure what your, what your role is, but I see you've got an MLA shirt on. I, I believe the roles of groups like the MLA is not to go and build software and not to go, and, not to go and, and play in that space. And I think the role is really around the education and awareness of this and the, and the resources and, and, the, and, and I guess the exposure a group like MLA has already in the industry. Um, that's the critical piece to, to drive this because this is this is not a situation where we look around and we see oh there's a competitor coming up and you know we get really worried about another software company coming into this space we welcome it and we should all welcome it right because not only is there a big enough market share and a big enough opportunity but a rising tide will lift all boats right and that's what we need and we need some serious horsepower to rise, to rise that tide and, and you know, groups like us spend millions of dollars trying to do that. But in order to get macro change, in order to get, in order to accelerate that, I think if we can start at that awareness and, and start at that education phase and really, really push that hard, uh, I think that that's going to be a, a, go a long, long way to do that. I've, I've spoken too much. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to be quick. Farmers are not going to change. You talk about change management. Um, nobody's going to change what they've been doing for generations um, unless it ticks one of these boxes and this is our, our, our kind of our, our methodology and, and thought process when we are developing new technologies. Is it going to um, save them money? Is it going to make them money? Or is it going to save them time? Because time and profit are the two biggest drivers in a beef production system. So. If you, you know, ideas are great, but ideas that aren't solving a problem are worth nothing. And, and I think we have to, I think unfortunately, and we've, this is a, is, a, is a rabbit hole I won't go down, but essentially the amount of solutions that have been developed out of great ideas that don't actually solve a problem uh, has meant that it's unfortunate, and I think that's, that's hindered the adoption of technology and data and and all of these solutions that are the quality solutions that are out there uh, because people have been burnt um, and I think you will now see um, the technology companies that have kind of you know three or four years ago there was a big spike ag tech was very sexy um, you know there is the businesses that are around today are solving problems uh, and I think there is a step change coming uh, but we all need to work together to lift it. Any other questions? 
Beautiful. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, you know, it's um, we said it'd be half an hour, and we're almost an hour. So, uh, and most of you are still here. So it's either the beer or or, uh, or or hopefully it was engaging, interesting. The beer's now run out, so we're done. No, just joking. Um, but honestly, we'd love to, uh, you know, thank you all for coming. Thank the gentleman on stage for, for sharing a really valuable time with, with here, uh, with us at AgriWeb, and, um, and sharing their views and insights in, in data technology and, and what the future looks like in, in how we can share and collaborate. Thank you very much.